Good evening and welcome to this very special web chat from inside the Department for Education in Westminster. Uh, a survey by the department this week found that three-fifths of teachers felt that others were being pushed out of the profession by bad behaviour. So what is the solution to disruption in the classroom and is it really that bad? Well luckily we have two of the country's greatest experts on the subject here this evening, uh, both of whom uh, have written books on this, but more importantly they uh, have spent many many years in front of the whiteboard dealing with disruptive pupils. Um, over to the uh, furthest left is Tom Bennett. Tom is a teacher, author and blogger extraordinaire. Uh, who also still finds time to answer teachers' questions every day on the TES uh, behaviour forums. And to my direct left is Charlie Taylor, a former teacher and head teacher who is now the government's behaviour advisor and very recently has been appointed the uh, new chief executive of the teaching agency. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name incidentally is Michael Shaw. I'm the deputy editor of the Times Educational Supplement. Uh, my role this evening really is just to pass on the questions that have been sent in by teachers. Uh, we are lucky to have a handful of select teachers in the audience here tonight. If you're watching this live, uh, do send us tweets to hashtag behaviour chat uh, or you can also post comments on the DFE Facebook page um, but before we move on to those questions uh, perhaps just a bit more about our, our panelists uh, Tom is it right that you were teaching this morning yes teaching today full-time teacher this is just a, this is my, my my night job my day job teaching excellent and how long have you been teaching for ten years now coming up for um, took to writing about it about five or six years ago when I started to realize that there are a lot of things that teachers could actually see and add to the general discussion about education. And what's the question you get asked most often on our forums? The question that most people ask is, I've got one child in my class that won't do as, I'm told, as they're told. That's the most common one. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we'll get that asked that one, that one later Usually, on. Usually, yes. <laughs> so, and, and Charlie, you've been both a teacher and a head. Indeed, yes. Yeah, I, I've, I've, up until, uh, well, I'm still on secondment from, from my school, which is the Willow School in West London, which is a special school for children with behavioural difficulties. And, and you described when you first arrived there that the school was quite like a, a war zone. It was, it was very hard that some, some very experienced teachers had, had very recently left and, and the school was in a bit of a state. Um, and it certainly took a bit of time to get things sorted out. Right, well we're moving on to the, the first questions now uh, and we'll be going to our, our studio audience. Um, do any of you here have any questions? Anyone at all? Oh, brilliant, fantastic. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm oh, just, just pass the mic, mic right across. Oh, Chris Gibbons from Stonewall, the uh, National Gay Equality Organisation, and we work to tackle homophobic bullying in schools. I was just wondering, with um, specific reference to initial teacher training and the new remit of the teaching agency, and obviously Charlie's new role with that, mm -hmm. what will the department and the teaching agency be doing to make sure that all newly qualified teachers feel equipped to deal with the range of behavioural issues, including all forms of bullying, such as, anti uh, as, such as homophobic bullying, for example? Um, I, I think it's a very good question and I, I think we have to make sure that um, teachers are prepared when they first go into the classroom. When we talk to many trainee teachers they feel that things could have been better when they were being trained um, and I think we need to ensure that the training of teachers happens not only the kind of theoretical bit but actually there's a real practical sense and what the best trainers do is they, they not only train um, they, they not only train the teachers, but they also give them really practical steps and able to be able to, to help out and to get things right. So I, I think it's really important, and I think the work that Stonewall has done on this I think is really important as well. Excellent. Have you anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say from a teacher's point of view, from a school's point of view, I think one of the most important things a school can do is to really step up to that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And instead of trying to bury it or hide it under the carpet, the school needs to make an issue of it and get yeah. public and be really vocal, do assemblies, do whatever they have to do, to diffuse it in any situations before they arise. Excellent. Well, we've, we're already starting to, I'm going to have some more questions from the, the audience in a minute, but we're already starting to get questions in from Twitter and Facebook. Um, one of these is, uh, uh, my summer-born child was too young for school and always in trouble. How can he be helped? Um, summer-born children, obviously, I consistent problem in the education system. I think that the summer issue is, is, is significant and substantial. We all know about the evidence pointing towards different levels of underachievement. I think when it comes, if you say getting in trouble, if, if by that it means he's causing trouble or involved in trouble, I think the, the parents in the school need to really park the whole summer child thing because that's not a significant factor here. Mm. Because you get children across all spectrums of the year who behave or misbehave. And so I think that's a bit of a red herring. What they need to do is tackle the behaviour, the reasons for the behaviour, 
and also externally deal with the behaviour as and when it occurs. So not even in the first few years of primary school when it might have the biggest impact? I, th <laughs> I, think, I think at that level, I think any good primary teacher or early years teacher will be looking at making sure that the ones that most need nurturing get the nurturing. So that's possibly the intervention. But once you get a few years into school, it's not a significant impact. I know. And I think one of the interesting things is how often children who are simply summer born get diagnosed with special educational needs. That seems mm. to happen more often. Mm. And I think sometimes one has to accept as a teacher that there are children who are going to be less mature than other, ch other children within your class. That doesn't actually necessarily mean they're summer born or not, as Tom says. Um, but it's about actually the school having a response to all the children. And I think if we get pulled too far down this issue that my child's summer born and therefore and therefore and therefore, actually we, we can end up um, ultimately not doing the things that we need to do, which is making sure the child's in school succeeding. Mm. Uh, a very useful question. Um, obviously, the, tonight's questions we're hoping mainly from teachers rather than from parents. This isn't Super Nanny. Um, another question we've had is that uh, what should happen with uh, SEN children who don't respond to star charts or praise? How should you deal with those? I imagine with your background as a head of yeah. a special school, you'll have some good ideas on that. Yeah, I mean, we have a, we have a, we have a very wide range of responses to children with behavioural difficulties. And, and I think sometimes the, 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 the use of star charts and praise actually very often isn't enough. Some children have got stuck, so stuck in patterns of behaviour. The, the, the first thing is actually teaching them how to be different. And um, I visited a fantastic school, Bartley Green, in, in Birmingham the other day, where they consciously have classes for children who are, who are struggling, and they really focus on teaching good behaviour. And if you go into nursery schools, they do that very well. As you go up into secondary schools, often that doesn't happen. So the first thing is about being really clear and teaching the behaviour you want to see. The second thing is actually there are other interventions that work very well too. There are some children who get themselves in such a state that actually they just need to be looked after for a little bit of time by the school. They need to be brought back into the... In, 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 into the um, effectively into the bubble of the school we, when yeah. our children are going through a really difficult time uh, and then and, and then we can help them but therapeutic interventions are sometimes helpful also checking that there aren't an underlying issue in terms of a special need undiagnosed and also um, uh, 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 just having a supportive uh, environment which helps children with clear boundaries as well and and and, and that's essential too do you find star charts and those kinds of prey systems work? Tom? Yeah, sure, absolutely. But I mean, as with any behavioural strategy, that the, the, it's just one arrow in your quiver, and you know, yeah. you, you use strategies if and when they occur. Um, special educational needs is such a, a broad area that it would be impossible to say this is what happens with yeah. children with special educational needs. You you work you do what works with that one child, mm. uh, and praise and rewards are a fabulous way of motivating people, and and sometimes a little bit of coercion, a little bit of you know discipline and direction mm. is also necessary too. The important thing is that the parent and the school works together in a partnership and well, they talk to each other constantly. Well, that, that actually leads us on to our next question we've, we've just had You're in, welcome. which is um, what if parents won't cooperate with a badly behaved child? What strategies can you do to get the families on board? Well, I, I, think, I think there's two, two things there really. I mean, I, I think some schools, the important thing I think is, is that when you go to really good schools, what they say is um, they don't operate in spite of their parents. They, they operate as much as possible in partnership with their parents. That They spend a lot of time reaching out to parents. Often parents who feel quite uncomfortable about going into schools. There is a sort of resonance about going to school that, that I think has an, the sort of smell of boiled cabbages and, and chalk that, 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 that can kind of send us spiralling back to our own childhood and our own, uh, our own unfortunate experiences of, of school for some parents. And therefore one of the things is actually reaching out, helping parents, making, making them feel welcome. But also being very clear early on about what the expectations are, what you expect from parents and what you're going to expect from the child. And I think when there's too much wriggle room there, when, when, when there's too much... Um, when parents don't really know what's expected of them, that, that's when they start to, to push the envelope a bit. But I think more clarity with parents is really good. And anything else to add to that? Yeah, time? I would say that I, I, would, I would always argue that 99% of parents around the world want the best for their children. Yeah. And if the teacher and the school starts off the relationship badly with the parent, even if perhaps the parent instigates that, the school really needs to work hard to make sure that the, that the parents also realise that that's exactly what you want for them too. Mm. I always start my parental conversations off with, hi, um, your son or daughter can be really, really great, but I need your help getting them back on track. Mm. And that's the kind of language you use to speak to parents. And as soon as you go down a more confrontational way, as, as Charlie's saying, mm. you kind of open up all these background images and, and, and it just all falls apart. So. And have you found that parents have got more combative with schools over the recent years? I, I think if you talk to teachers, they'll, they'll certainly say that there are groups of parents who, who, who probably do push harder than they used to. Um, I think there is also a job for schools to do, actually, which is about educating parents how to complain, how to raise an issue. Uh, some parents um, get very het up, they fly off the handle, they come storming into the school, mm. and they start screaming and shouting. And actually, 
it's, it's completely reasonable for parents to, to make a complaint, to come and raise issues, but they need to do that in the right way. They need to do it in, in a way that, that, that means that teachers aren't being um, put in a, a difficult position, they're not being shouted at. And actually one of the things schools can do is to train parents about, if you've got a problem, this is how you, this is how you deal with it, and this is what we expect, and, and actually this behaviour we won't put up with. Excellent. Thank you for that. We'll take another question now from our, our studio audience, some of whom are, are very busy tweeting, I can see. Um, any questions at all? Oh, yes, please. Gentlemen here. Hi, uh, my name is Alex, and I'm from uh, Anti Bullying Pro, which is uh, at the moment a DFE funded program that oh. works uh, with about 300 schools uh, to encourage young people and staff to tackle bullying. Uh, so we give them the practical ideas and a bit of inspiration. Uh, a bit of inspiration. Um, but my question is. I know the DfE has recently slimmed down the guidance uh, when it comes to, to bullying, uh, which may have left some schools a little unsure of what they should be doing. And I wondered if uh, the panel could talk about any uh, particular particular examples of good practice they've seen when it comes to schools tackling bullying, because obviously it's a massive priority. Because young people spend about well 11,000 hours of their life in full-time education, yeah. and yeah. it's really important that every single hour is a happy and, and safe one. Could, yeah. could we have to start with, with Tom on that one? Or tackling yeah, sure. Bullying? Um, I actually absolutely agree with the slimming down of the bullying advice, simply because from my experience in schools, whether you get a thousand sheets of paper or a hundred sheets of paper, it, it, does, it doesn't matter. You know, what matters is, is somebody reading it. And if that means that it's ten sheets of paper and it's the best advice possible, then that's what counts. And secondly, I would say that the thing that really makes a school system effective to beat bullying is to have people in the school who give a damn about it. That will always be the main thing. This is exactly the same with the other gentleman's question as well. There's got to be people in school who think the bullying's an issue, who are actively looking for it, and are actively dealing with it. It doesn't matter how many policies you have. So that's it. Key people on the ground. Um, I absolutely agree with that. I went to I, the school actually I was talking about before, Bartley Green mm. School again in, um, in, in, in the West Midlands. And one of the things, they had a very simple system where children could log on and could just report an, a, 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 a bullying incident. It was very quick, it was very efficient. One of the kids showed me how it worked. And the teacher could give loads of information and data about what was going on around bullying. And, and, it, and it wasn't a huge bureaucratic burden, it wasn't taking up lots of people's time, but it was just a way that children could log a concern and that could then be dealt with. Excellent. We've had another question that's just come in, which um, is, do you know of any new technologies that could help behaviour? I know you were saying that you were in a school today that, uh, where most people said iPads. Um, do you think there are any technologies that might help? Um, I, I think schools often use, uh, the school I was in today also was, was, was using Sims a lot in order to, uh, to, to track and keep an eye of, of progress with behaviour. And, and I think in a school like mine where we're held to account not only for the academic progress of our, of our children, but also the changes we make in terms of children's behaviour, we've got lots, lots of systems in place that actually measure that. Um, some schools, th there are systems you can buy into um, that help to log every incident and every. And I think for schools, particularly who are making a real, who are trying to move things on, who really want to change the whole culture of the school, I think some of these IT systems are really useful to do that. We, we don't use a lot of IT for that in my school at the moment, but that may be because I've got sort of Luddite tendencies. But but um, certainly I've seen schools where it's been very effective. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I would probably exceed Charlie in his Luddite tendencies, <laughs> in that I feel that technology in education is very much like a dishwasher. I mean, they're a fabulous labour-saving device, but somebody has to fill it. And if nobody fills it, the plates stay just as dirty. Mm. And I think there are some really good behaviour tracking systems out there, um, which makes it very much easier for you to, for instance, collate data and see if there's a pattern or a trend mm. in a child's behaviour. And that is the big improvement. But as ever, it needs to be filled in, it needs to be used, it needs to be attended to. Mm. And that's, again, where you need people who are tight and on that and care about it. Um, we've got another question that looks like it may have come from a parent, but uh, I think it's still valid, certainly for primary schools. Uh, how can I teach my child about boundaries? And where is, where is the line between naughtiness and testing boundaries? Uh, shall I start with that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for that one. Um, <laughs> the, the, the difference between naughtiness and testing boundaries is a philosophical question, which I probably don't have time to go into here, <laughs> even if I could answer it. <coughs> the, the question about teaching boundaries is, the science of it is simple, the execution of it is difficult, simply because the science is you set boundaries, you make them clear, and then you stick to them. And if the child crosses those boundaries, they experience a consequence of some kind, which shows them that the boundary has been crossed. Now, those five steps there are the simplest thing in the world. And in fact, it's the basis of all my behaviour management advice for teachers in general. So I've kind of talked myself out of a job here. But the, the, the reason why it doesn't happen and it falls apart is because it's not applied and it's not consistent. So yeah. set the boundaries, decide what's a boundary for yourself, tell them what a boundary is, 
I'm not a big fan of negotiating boundaries simply because I'm an adult in a classroom and I know what's best for them to some extent, mm -hmm. which sounds authoritarian because it is. Um, and then just repeat, repeat and rinse until mm. they learn. Do you, do you think it's as clear as that? It, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think the way, I, I think the way to do it is actually to take a step back um, and is to actually really think, to plan what you think is, what you, what, what you think the boundaries should be. I think the worst way of setting boundaries is you try and set them as you go along. So mm. as you're confronted by a bit of behaviour, you think, oh, is this okay or not? The way to do it is to actually step back, think this is, the, this is the kind of stuff I'm prepared to put up with and actually this is where I'm going to draw the line. And then when you come to dealing with the situation, you deal with it calmly and in a, in a non-reactive way rather than kind of just following the child around, kind of responding. I'd like to ask one of the questions we've had on Facebook quite a bit in the, in the build-up to this web chat. And, uh, oh, just need to read Thank you, sorry. Um, and that is, um, what strategies would you recommend for improving low-level disruptive behaviour in the classroom? Over to you, John. Uh, low level disruptive behaviour, funnily enough, it, it's what frustrates teachers more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, you, you hear the kind of big stories of you know, chairs being thrown around, mm. teachers being attacked. Actually, thank goodness, those, those are very rare. Um, the low level disruptive of, of, of individual children or one or two children or groups of children, I, I think the main things are this. First of all, to be absolutely clear about what the rules are within the class and, and to be prepared to follow through with rewards and praise and, 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 and consequences for, for children who are doing the wrong thing. That absolute clarity about that. Um, there's, there's basic stuff about things like seating plans, actually, and being assertive about the seating plan. If child A uh, is not coping because they're sitting there, actually be, be prepared to move them. And if it means they need to sit with their mates, that's completely fine as well. Mm. Um, the other thing with, with disruptive children is trying to unpick actually why they're being low level disruption and actually it may be that, that, that if it's the quality of teaching that isn't good enough if the quality of the lessons isn't good enough if there isn't a real understanding of it for example a child with a special need who's sitting there kind of not able to read or whatever it might be then that feeds into to low level disruption isn't that shifting the, the blame to teachers slightly to say it's about the motivation well it, 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 uh, you, you 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 deal with what you're confronted by and if you have a child who's, who's low levelly disrupting your, your lessons constantly actually Yes, you can have really clear boundaries in place, but also you need to respond to that child. And if, if they're not, if, they, if, 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 what's work, if what you're trying isn't working, then it's time to have a plan B as well. And your, your ultimate yeah, tips for low level disruption? <laughs> yeah, my top tips. Yeah. Um, just echoing to what Charlie said there, um, it's not the teacher's fault that the yeah. misbehaviour has occurred, but it is their responsibility to mm. deal with it. That's what, that's what we're paid for. Yeah. So there is a, a, a subtle but important distinction to be made there. Low level disruption, as you said, uh, Teachers worry about chair checkers, yeah. but that is relatively rare demographically. Mm. Low level disruption is the kryptonite of a classroom. Mm. It is the drip drip effect. It, it carves a ravine. It carves a valley from a mountain over time and it will destroy teachers. And the reason why it's so difficult to deal with is because it seems like it's not really that big a deal. Mm. That I don't need to deal with it because it's just somebody humming or rocking on a chair, or whatever's disrupting the education. And that's how I define bad behaviour, disrupting the education of the classroom. W so, sorry, can I? I was about to say, were there, were there any particular examples of low-level disruption that uh, you found especially annoying? Uh, pen clicking. Pen clicking. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah I, I find it very hard. To Imitating a Scottish <laughs> accent. <laughs> Badly. I don't mind if it's done well. Um, one quite topical question <coughs> that's just arrived is, uh, how do we avoid behaviour problems when the raising participation age kicks in? Um, a bit of a repeat of what happened about 30 years ago where suddenly teachers found themselves with pupils who are a few years older. Mm. If students are having to stay on until 18, 19, um, what does that mean for teachers and will that affect your behaviour strategies? I would say that the behaviour strategies, in essence, from primary school on up to school leaving age, no matter what age it is, are relatively similar. I mean, the basic skeleton of it. Mm. As they get older, obviously with, for instance, A-level pupils, you allow them much more um, managed freedom, I would call it, because that's a natural part of growing up by allowing them to you know, perhaps take off the stabilizers and, and, and use their tricycles by themselves. But the basic fundamentals are still exactly the same. You tell them what you expect of them, and then you call them out on it when it doesn't happen. And as children get older, what a lot of teachers do is they think, oh, they're A-level kids. I can't keep them behind, mm -hmm. or I can't call home because they're wearing you know, trainers and jeans and you know, they call me man and bruv. And it's all exactly the same. Is, isn't there a risk that if you, if you treat them like primary school pupils, they'll uh, react to that? No, you treat them like young adults. Yeah. You know? And everyone should, you can respond to that. They still need you to be an adult. Yeah. This is the thing people forget. They're still, I still regard them as being, not childish, but young adults. Not adults, young adults. And they are getting there with our help. 
And actually, what you want to talk about the consequences is what also the, the kind of positive reinforcement that just does not go away. And you talk to you, you, you I mean, yeah. you, for goodness sake, you give a sticker to a 17 year old and they still get kind of, I mean, pathetically, if you gave, if you, if you started awarding stickers to Tom and I now, <laughs> both of us would think, oh, that's pathetic, it's stupid. And afterwards, we I'm would be, at, at, yeah, at, we at this point, I'll be yeah. giving you both gold stars. It's Thank fine. you very much. Exactly. Um, we, we, well, we haven't we, earned yeah. it yet. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, I should take another two questions from the, from the audience. Oh, uh, this question here, please. We'll just wait for your microphone to arrive. Hi, I'm Sarah. I work for Teach First, and I'm a former teacher. Um, at my former school, um, mm -hmm. they are introducing something called restorative practice. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard of it. Um, they're rolling it out quite a lot in Hull at the moment, yeah. um, and it involves um, using other pupils um, to facilitate discussions between children who've been disruptive. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you thought there was any scope for investing in that sort of across the country on a bigger I, I, scale. My, my, my feelings on restorative justice are this. If it's done in a, in a very well-organised system where people absolutely understand the process, where people are thoroughly trained um, within the way that restorative justice works, and if there is a real sense that, that the restorative justice process is actually a voluntary process that, for example, the victim and the bully can go through, if there's a real understanding and an underpinning and a training of it, th then it can be effective. Where I get nervous is where people take on restorative justice in a piecemeal way. And a few years ago, I used to do some work with uh, an anti-bullying charity, Kidscape. And one of the things they said is we quite often got cases where restorative justice had gone horribly wrong and effectively a bullied child and, and a bully were placed in the same classroom. So restorative justice is proven to be excellent, but there has to be a real commitment from the school and the people within it and the leaders within the school to make sure that it works. Mm, if, I, if I can just add to that, um, we're kind of echoing each other a lot, I do apologise. Um, I've seen this work really badly in schools. And one of the things I get on the behaviour forums with the Tez is often people saying, I've been told to use this and it's gone horribly wrong. What am I doing wrong? And my answer is, you're doing nothing wrong. Every strategy, as I said, is an arrow in your quiver. You use the strategy that's appropriate. If you've got, for instance, two, uh, two girls who are best friends and they've fallen out and they've had a fight, restorative justice is a very effective way of getting them back together oh. because it makes them talk to each other, maybe even get their families involved, whatever's required. If you get a situation where the school adopts, for instance, a restorative justice only approach, you may as well say we're using a gold star only approach and see what problems that leads to as well. And I think in terms of bullying, it can be disastrous. It's a terrible strategy sometimes. Use it sometimes, but in its place. I would keep it really firmly on a leash. Thank you for that question. Uh, one we've had from several teachers on Facebook was, do you think avoiding creative lessons is an effective way to maintain good behavior? Should your lessons be very, very drab and straight jacketed uh, that way that way you'll be able to guarantee you can control the class I think it's a I, I think it's a it, it's a, it's a risky strategy in the long term I think there's a real temptation for teachers when they're working in a school with challenging kids when they've got a when they've got a class who's very twitchy that you sort of there's a race to the bottom and in the end you think the, the way to contain these kids is to get them through the door plant a worksheet in front of them get their head standing and, and keep them going um, actually in the longer term you, you and I worked in a school where that seemed to be the kind of one and yeah. only behavior management strategy uh, if, if, if you end up doing that and you end up stop being creative and stop being interesting and, and stop making your lessons exciting, in the end, in the long term, you pay a heavy price, I think. Mm, yeah. I think creative, again, is another very kind of nebulous concept. You have to be careful how it's used. What I usually say to teachers who are struggling with very difficult classes who are openly confrontational is I usually say, for a while, for a short time, park the group work park the fun stuff, park the dancing bears and the holograms, oh. and get back to something which is very structured and very, you know, short-term goals with easily achieved goals, but then increasing challenge and so yeah. on. Um, so emphasizing structure is enormously useful as a behavioral tool in the right situation. But I mean, creativity, as I say, it's a very vague concept. It can mean lots of things. I mean, <coughs> creativity should be something which is threaded through and integral through your entire teaching career. So it's, it's, it's a, a difficult thing to remove entirely, I would say. Some of the, the broader questions we've had are about uh, whether you think behaviour itself really has got worse uh, over the past 20 years or so. Uh, and I mentioned the attitude of parents mm. before, um, but do you think it's roughly stayed the same? I know that the survey from the department this week found that uh, only 6% of the teachers who responded thought there was poor behaviour in their classes, which uh, would actually surprise quite a lot of people. I mean, I, I would start off by saying that it's, it's very difficult. I've, I've talked about 10 years, so you know, what do I know has happened in 10 years in the schools in which I've been exposed to? I mean, I'd, I would say in those 10 years, behaviour has been fairly constant in the schools that I've been exposed to. When it comes to data like that, I'm always deeply suspicious because, again, you've got massive um, response bias and so on, and also what does bad behaviour mean and who quantifies it? And unfortunately, I would say that a mistake that's been often been made in the past 
is that the people who tend to collect behaviour data often have a vested interest in it being projected to or skewed towards a certain end of the spectrum, mm. if I can be polite about it. That includes schools, it includes teachers who don't report, it, you know, it could include uh, people higher up in, in the department. You know, there's lots of different ways in which this can be skewed. So I think that's a, a, a different issue and a bigger issue to tackle. I would broadly say that in the last, say, 50 years of Western European style democracies, we've seen uh, what Frank Freddy calls a, a crisis of parental, a crisis of adult authority, mm. which is to say that deference and authoritarian deference has eroded a great deal. You no longer get people tipping their hat to you because you're a teacher. That's gone. Forget it. It's over. And I'm not saying you have to earn that either. What I'm saying is you have to build up the authority with children these days. Do you think we exaggerate the problem of behaviour in schools? Um, I think the, the, way I, the way I see it, I think, is generally the trajectory of, of, of behaviour is actually things have actually got better than they were. When I first started teaching, there were, it, you go into some schools and it felt like there were real no-go areas. Um, where, where I, mean, I went, went into a school actually quite near here, and a teacher said to me, "Don't, I wouldn't really go down that corridor at lunchtime, yeah. particularly." Um, we've moved on from there. Um, I think generally, most of the behaviour, most of the time in most of the schools, is pretty good. I do think there are a group of um, children who are very anxious, who are very damaged, who um, are perhaps more violent, more aggressive than they used to be, uh, and I think that that group has probably got bigger um, in the last few years. Um, I think the general trend of behaviour in our schools, um, and I think that's because the expertise of teachers has improved, and I think the philosophy of managing behaviour has improved since I first started teaching, um, means that behaviour is better. Whether the behaviour that children coming in with is any better, um, I wouldn't be sure about. But teachers, I think, are doing a better job. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to try and fit in as many extra questions as possible. What answer? answer. Um, what, uh, one, one question is, would banning mobile phones in schools help? Uh, up to local head teachers, local decisions. You wouldn't, you wouldn't um, implement a, a nationwide ban? Nationwide, no way. Some schools like having mobile phones, they like getting... I mean, I, I was in a lesson the other day, uh, people, it was a DT lesson, they got all their phones out, took a photograph of the work that they were doing, put it back in their pockets, it didn't cause any disruption whatsoever. Completely fine, didn't have a problem with that. If that's what the school wants to do, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I, I, very quickly, I would say that in some schools that works absolutely fine, in other schools it's a complete disaster mm -hmm. because it's an eternal distraction from them. So I think schools mm -hmm. should be allowed to make up their own policy in that one. Um, the next one is it's a scenario question. Uh, I think this is coming from Leanne Kathleen Muir. Um, it's the start of term. You're mm -hmm. unsure of the names of the people in your class. So how do you effectively apply consequences? Oh, well, I can start off with that one. Um, it, well, this sounds like this is the same situation that many supply teachers find themselves in. Mm -hmm. One of the things you do is, first of all, you sit them down in the order that you want them sat in very quick. Mm. Um, you ask them to get their books out, you ask them to get their planners out if, if needs be. If it's someone you've just seen do something in the school and you don't know who it is, you, you take a snapshot inside your head and you find someone that does know who it is. Mm. But the important thing is you follow up. If it yeah. takes you a week or a day, you follow up and you let them know you will never give up until mm. you find out who they are. And you can normally find one of the other kids to grass them up yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the huggy bear of the school. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'd say that. I mean, I, I used, when I first started teaching, I worked as a supply teacher. My aim was always to know all the names of the kids in my... This is primary, so it was, mm. you know, I was only teaching one class. To name all the names of the kids by morning break time, so that for the rest of the day, they would all get called by their names. Did you have any tricks for learning that? Uh, yeah, I used to get them on the carpet at the beginning of the lesson, and, 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 and we just played a game with me remembering their names, and it was all kind of interactive and entertaining. And on uh, policies, one question we've had is, how often in your average school day do you find yourself implementing the behaviour policy? I can answer that one quite easily. Behaviour policy isn't something that happens when a child misbehaves. Behaviour policy is something that happens constantly throughout your teaching. So it should be, it should be an integral part of your practice. Yeah. I would say in my school the behaviour policy is lived all day, every day, by all the staff. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. That's, about <laughs> <way of> so <laughs> that's, the, that's the phrase I wanted to use. So it's every lesson? Yeah. Excellent. Constantly. And, um, uh, with one gender-related question, which is, do you think punishing boys and girls in different ways is appropriate? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> what, making boys wear girls' clothes or something? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, I, I, I imagine it's whether, whether you need different types of sanctions. Mm. Do you need yeah, to shout yeah. more at boys? Do you need to? Um, my feeling with this is that actually that, that what you don't want is an unintended consequence from, from, a, from a, a, a sanction. And the danger is actually... The, the point of any sanction is what I do now, the sanction I impose, is going to make the behaviour less likely to happen next time. So what you have to make sure when you're giving it a sanction, is there an unintended consequence that will actually encourage the child to behave like that again? 
Thank you. And if you had one final tip for all the teachers out there about the best way to handle behaviour, what would that one tip be? Seating plan. I'd say routines, routines, routines. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw it to a close there. Um, you can carry on asking questions to Tom on the behaviour website of the TES. Uh, he will be on there most days checking the questions. Uh, and uh, Charlie Taylor's excellent checklist for schools, as well as his reports on attendance uh, and on alternative provision, can be found on the DfE website. Uh, it only remains for me to get everyone to thank our panellists. Thank you. Thank you.